Testing, one, two, three, four. Hey everyone, how's it going? It's seven o'clock, so we're gonna get started right on time. Welcome to the Hacker Dojo in Mountain View, California. I'm your host, Conan O'Brien. No, I'm just kidding, it's me, Kevin Vary. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Apple, and I'm a member here at the Dojo. Uh, if you don't know how lightning talks work, it's really simple. Uh, we have a dry erase board here at the front, and you can sign up to give a talk. Each talk will last about five minutes, and we'll, um, and people can kind of talk about whatever they want and what they've been learning or working on or really anything they want to talk about. I don't care. And uh, it'll be really fun. Uh, hopefully we learn a lot of cool stuff. Uh, you don't have to sign up super far ahead of time. You can come sign up. Uh, in between talks uh, if you haven't signed up already. Uh, we also have a beer keg on tap in the back, and it's really tasty, so en enjoy that. Uh, lightning talks have been going on uh, at the Hacker Dojo for many, many years. I don't know exactly how long, but many years. And we're also filming this. We're streaming live on YouTube, so if you go to the Hacker Dojo YouTube channel, you can find this live stream and then you can also watch it later afterwards. And I think that's pretty much it for my introduction. Um, so if when, when it's your turn, we've got this lapel microphone that we can give you. And then uh, if the audience wants to ask some questions, we've got this wireless microphone we can give you. And then we can also help you uh, get your laptop plugged into the TV if you want to use that. And we've got this new spotlight that's kind of nice. So, all right, let's get to it. And if you want to do some stand-up comedy, you can too. I don't care. <laughs> all right, our you're our first uh, presentation, and we're gonna. Is it George? All right. So, yeah, you've got the lapel mic. Okay. And take it away. Oops. What happened with this? All right. We are ready to go. Is I, I want to share some experience that I am doing with some friends in Spain that is called InnoDNA. Is how is the innovation DNA of your team? One of the things that I, I really surprised is when you are talking with a group of people, you are working with a group of people, you don't know exactly what is the profile of each one. You can use technologies very sophisticated in how to evaluate what is your profile. And in that sense, there is um, a book that is called a Strength Finder uh, from Gallup that lists all these 34 talents. These 34 talents are uh, grouped into four uh, elements. How you are in the execution, how you are in the influencing of people, how you are relationship building, and how you are strategic thinking. And one ex ex exercise that we are testing is when you have a group of people that you work together in a project, and you want to know what these people brings to the table, it's very hard because you need to learn a lot of the people, uh, the, the profile of each of the people. And we decide how create that, that each one of the talents that are here listed have a phrase that identify, and you say, okay, how I choose five of these talents that are my, my, my most valuable elements. And these ones, then you put that into a table that is each member of the team, if you have a five member team, a 10 member team, you create a, this table. And this table, you mark each one of the five elements. The strength finder is a full test, very sophisticated, very good one that you can do online and identify which ones are your five elements. But usually you don't have the time to do that 
you don't have on hand that information. And we cheat in some way how to do it with these questions. That you generate your table, and when you generate the table, you say, okay, what do you bring and create a matrix of what is the value that each of the persons say? And in a meeting, you start having that discussion and say, okay, this is my five talents. I am doing these kind of things, and I want to be recognized or I want to be a leader of these things. When you are doing agile development, you try to bring all the people all together to have a discussion and lead doing the best thing that you can do it. We listed that into these kind of tables, and then we have a final description that say, okay, you say these are your skills, and from that skills, which one you want to be the most valuable element. And from that, you create some environment that the people start to really participate in and be proactive within a group. And if you are a project manager, if you are a leader, that kind of things are very interesting Then you, you are able to make it that easy for you to generate that description, uh, that uh, profile of the people, and integrate your team. That is called the Inno DNA, and we are building a, a course how you can be using that and teach you in an hour how you learn that. And every time that you have a, a, a meetings, a groups, you can invest 10 to 15 minutes uh, before creating the team discussions, have that, con uh, that knowledge about who is working with you. That is my, my challenge. We are testing that and really so far has been working very good. Questions? Is battery low? <laughs> check, check. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I know a story about Alan Turing during World War II. Um, he was trying to break the German code and he couldn't do it. So um, well, one day he had uh, lunch with uh, like uh, maybe a, uh, a woman who told, her, uh, who told him that uh, everyone, sp uh, everyone speaks with a quirk. So um, for everyone, there is some sort of pattern to what, what, what they say. And uh, so he used that pattern, that quirk, in the German communication uh, with, um, for example, hating their um, leader, uh, Hitler, <laughs> and uh, to, break the, uh, to break the code, to uh, decipher what each symbols mean. And um, that really helped. So, uh, and uh, do you think that, um, uh, like, um, uh, whoever told him that it's about a speech quirk wasn't really, um, mentioned kind of like shows how um, uh, in any kind of uh, research or uh, development, um, there needs to be a, a one person who knows a lot about something. So he's very deep into the, no into the, no into the knowledge. Um, and and, and other, another person who's very broad in, in her knowledge or his knowledge, um, who, who knows a lot of, um, a, a lot of topics, maybe, maybe not very deep, so very broad. Um, and then the two working together can help uh, solve many um, deadlocks in, um, in, uh, in, 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 in research. Yeah, well, that, that, that in some senses is very similar in the way how you identify that. And here we are building something that can be done very easy for any person within a group. And at the very end of the uh, discussions, you know who, uh, wh what is the profile of each one of the persons. Uh, yeah. That, that is the, the advantage we are, we are trying to focus and, and make it that so easy, not a very special, a very uh, knowledge people, is anybody can do that. Yeah, um, another story of like um, in the Amazon, there is a group of people called um, uh, helpers and other people who are more interested in um, uh, finding, re finding resources. So um, like uh, there is like uh, one kind of people who are more into uh, emotional games. Um, uh, helping people and other p kind of people who are more into um, gathering re uh, resources, being knowing how something works. So one 
so one group of people are more into caring about something. For example, you have a leaky faucet, you care about it, though you're not exactly interested in it. Interested will mean how, knowing how the faucet works, what are the components of the faucet, how to build one, while caring about the faucet will be um, how to fix it, how to care for it, how to make sure it doesn't leak again. <laughs> like, 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 like that. Mm. Yep. I, I, well, but that is, you are talking, we're, we're talking into two, two different ar areas. One that is the technology side or the knowledge about technology, and then the other one about the profile or skills of the person. And we are very much into the skills. Okay. I, I'm, I want to understand well, uh, is it based on self reporting? So, in other words, everyone at the beginning ranks their own uh, uh, sort of top skills and top uh, priorities? That's correct. It, it's not, uh, not priorities. Priorities implies activities. Here is the skills. And you say, okay, I have these 34. You choose your own five, and each person choose your, their own five. Uh -huh. And then that five is loaded into the matrix, and you know how balanced is your team. Is sometimes you find that the team is everybody's in the relationship buildings and nobody's in execution. And that could be a problem in the long term. And the idea here is, is a self, that's a very good uh, point. It's a self uh, uh, evaluation for each person. Or if you are, uh, we run that in the two ways. One, having teams and run the strength finder test that it takes for about an hour to, to do it. It has a cost but give you a very deep uh, profile of you. If you do with the uh, trick that we are building here uh, with uh, some questions, you can do that into five minutes uh, time frame. And that's uh, very different, do not cost anything, and everybody participate actively in how to make it that. All right, thanks. All right. If no one else has any questions, then we'll give you a round of applause. All right, next up is Masha. So hey everybody, I'm Masha. Um, so I was a uh, research scientist at Lenovo focused on large language models and explainable AI. Um, and so I will talk about prompt engineering. Why will it not go? Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Sorry about these, t oh, okay, no, it just, okay, great. Okay, so what is prompt engineering? So I asked ChatGPT what it is. Um, so it's the process of creating or modifying the input or prompt to give into a language model in order to elicit a specific response or generate specific output. So basically, so like we have these foundation models, right? So like chat GPT, stable diffusion and so on. And then we need to give them um, input prompts in natural language. And so like, but you know, as we all, as we all know, like, you know, kind of rewording the prompt or like inserting different characters into the prompt can give us a different output. And so like prompt engineering is basically like the task of, you know, kind of changing the prompt around to like get it to give us the output that we want. Um, so why do we need to prompt engineer? Why doesn't the model just already understand what we want? Um, yeah, so models are bad at uh, understanding user intent currently because like this is misaligned with the training objective. Um, and so if you look at large language models like like ChatGPT or like um, you know Bloom and so on, so like these the training objective for these is the is a uh, next word objective. So they're trained to um, predict the um, next word that um, occurs after a, a specific prompt. 
And um, yeah, so, and um, you know, because this training objective is misaligned with user intent, like you can get kind of these we weird things where like, um, you know, adding, uh, we're adding parentheses to a prompt um, can actually like give you better results. Like it can, you know, add more bacon if you put parentheses around it and so on. Um, and so what are some uh, techniques that you can use to prompt engineer? Um, yeah, so one is like direct specific instructions. So if you want the model to translate, so like tell it to tell it to translate. You see, like if you give it no instruction, um, then like it's it's not really gonna know what you want it to do. Um, and then also, so the one important thing to remember is that the completions uh, match the style of the prompt. Um, and so um, yeah, so just make sure that um, yeah, like your prompt matches the uh, style that you want it to have. Um, so I'll skip this to a more interesting one. So chain of thought prompting. Um, so if you have logical reasoning tasks, like you want, like you want the model to like, um, you know, complete some sort of math equation, like, or you want it to like, you know, answer, a, you know, a question that requires some reasoning. Like you can add, let's think step by step um, to the front of the prompt, um, and then that actually like improves performance a lot. So as much as like 60% on some benchmarks, um, and then you can use it for like any type of reasoning, whether it's like, you know, arithmetic, symbolic, or common sense, and so on. Um, okay, so debugging the prompts. Um, yeah, so one thing you can do is, is choose a seed to kind of, you know, control the random output of the model and then change one word at a time. Um, rephrasing your prompt. So as I said before, um, you know, if you like include different phrasing, the model might produce better or worse results. Um, and so then another thing you can do is um, create multiple variations of your prompt and then choose the one with the lowest perplexity. So perplexity is a measure of how complex the prompt is. Um, and so generally like, you know, if like if the prompt is less complex, then the model produces a better output. Um, because essentially what the model is doing is um, it's looking at, at patterns in its training data that'll match the prompt. And then the less complex the prompt is, the more likely it is that the model will find a corresponding pattern in its training data. Um, so what are some prompt engineering tools? I don't know if I have time for this one, um, but you know, I will skip to the end. Um, oh, I do have time, okay. So, okay. So like I categorize these into like multiple categories. So one is like prompt generators. Um, and so like this one is like on the, all of these are on the Hugging Face Hub. Um, so you can, um, yeah, so, so you can put in a prompt and then it'll generate multiple variations of the prompt and then this will help you in testing. And then it's available for multiple different types of models. So like ChatGPT, like stable diffusion and so on. Um, and there's another category of tools that I call kind of prompt IDEs. Um, and so then these will these basically allow you to like organize your prompts and then like test them and then collect feedback. Um, and then yeah, so human loop and promptable are like good examples of these. Um, and then um, yeah, so prompt source is like an open source uh, tool that'll let you do this. So like yeah, like version, track prompts, test them and so on. Um, there's prompt marketplaces, so like prompt base is one of those where you can like buy and sell prompts uh, for multiple different models. Um, and then there's like other tools to like uh, kind of make developing like with these models easier. Um, so one is GPT index. Um, and so, you know, as some of you may know, like, um, like large language models have a context size limit. So for example, like OpenAI DaVinci, like you can only have a prompt that's um, 4,096 tokens long. Um, and so like, how do you get around this? So like, what if you want to like, you know, answer questions about like a book or a set of documents or something? So like you can use GPT index to like build an index across the set of documents. So, like, and then, and then you can ask questions or like do some other query on it without worrying about the uh, prompt size limitation. Um, and so debugging, so like debugging prompts, like this is, you know, it's still kind of like, you know, early days of this, um, but this is a good, uh, ICE is a good tool to do this, um, where like um, you can basically, it basically allows you to like split up your prompts into smaller chunks um, and then debug um, each chunk. And so for example, like let's say you're, you're you know, trying to answer a question and you're trying to see like, okay, does this medical document talk about placebos? So like, you know, you can split that up into multiple steps. So like you can look at like um, each paragraph and then say like, okay, does this paragraph talk about a placebo? Does this one and so on? And so like, 
um, this tool will kind of allow you to split up your prompt like that and then like debug it. Um, okay, so the future of prompt engineering. So like, will prompt engineering be a thing in the future? Um, so I think probably not. Um, so as I said before, um, prompt engineering is like, for, so prompt engineering in terms of like, you know, kind of like doing model specific incantations or like, you know, rewarding the prompt or like things like that. Like, you know, we have to do that because the training objective is misaligned with user intent. Um, but yeah, so, so I think that the need to do this will probably like go away as we like kind of train, as we kind of, you know, change the, um, the uh, training techniques of these models um, to become more aligned with user intent. And so eventually like, you know, so eventually like you, you won't really have to like, um, like carefully craft your wording or anything for your prompt to like, you'll be able to like, you know, just like you could do with Google search. Like you can say like, you could say like, you know, oh, that movie from the 90s about like a boy who stays home and then it'll give you home alone. So eventually like you'll be able to like do stuff like that and then throw random stuff at it and then like it'll understand what you want. Um, okay, so the future of prompt engineering. So like when we talk about prompt engineering, so like giving a model a prompt in natural language is just one way to control its output. Um, and so like what are other like ways that we can do that? And so you can imagine new interfaces to control the model output. Um, so for example, like virtual knobs or switches. So like, like your TV, for example, has switches that can, you know, allow you to control the brightness and the contrast and so on. Um, and then, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of fiddle with these knobs rather than like trying to describe in natural language what you want. Um, and so you can, you, and so, you know, you can imagine an interface like that for a model. Um, and then also like guided generation where like you give the model like, you know, some type of chunk of what you want and then it'll just kind of fill in the rest. Um, and then another thing is a, um, yeah, a purpose built um, domain specific language for prompts. Um, so basically like, you know, a way to kind of, you know, a, like a more structured way of prompting that'll allow you to combine a text prompt um, and then also like, you know, some sort of scripting. And so, so in this way, like, you, you can kind of like version your prompts, you can organize them better. Um, and then also like, you know, under the hood, it could kind of like, you know, maximize efficiency of your calls to kind of, you know, like reduce expensive calls like to the actual like open AI API or whatever it is you're using. Um, yeah, so like algorithms to make prompt search easier. Um, yeah, so like, um, so like for hyperparameter tuning, like we have algorithms like grid search um, that can allow you to search for the best hyperparameters. And so you can imagine like similar things for prompts. Um, so, okay, so that is, okay, that's it, that's all I have. So yeah, any questions, um, feel free to ask. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how to actually, is there a way to get ChatGPT to like work off your own data sets? To what? Work off your own data sets and be able to query your own data sets. Yeah, there is. So like you can use GPT index to do that. Um, so basically like, um, you know, I mean, I linked to it in this presentation and I, you know, I can send it out if you want. Um, but yeah, so like, yeah, so you can just, you know, follow the, you can just like put all of your documents into a folder. Like you can, you know, use GPT index to like build an index over it. And then, you know, you can like ask questions. You can send some sort of query and then like, yeah, the, the GPT index like documentation goes over all of that. Um, so yeah. Um, so uh, people are playing with the AI generated art and basically they give it a prompt and the AI will create art based on that prompt. Like uh, for example, you can tell, tell it to um, paint um, something with the parrot at a beach. Um, and uh, I feel like um, what you're talking about with the prompt engineering is very related to um, AI generated art. Right. Yeah. And, and also like a Google image search, you can maybe type in uh, uh, oh boy, um, alone at home, 1990 film, and, uh, and the image search will come up with the home alone, maybe a home alone movie poster or something. Right. Sorry about 
Uh, so I've, I've used ChatGPT, but just as an amateur briefly. Uh, and when I give it the same prompt twice, uh, it seems to give different results. Is there, it, there's some randomness in Yeah, in there, the there is randomness. And so, ba so basically the way that it generates the next token is like, you know, okay, like it has like, um, it has like a list of candidate tokens that it considers, and then it assigns a probability to each candidate token. Yeah. Um, and so, like, so like basically, it chooses tokens with some probability. And so, like, there there is like randomness in there. And so, like, you know, what you want to do if you wanted to produce the same output every time, like, you can set a seed. I'm not sure if you can do it with Chat GPT, but like, with with GPT three, like, you can do it. You can set a seed, and then it'll produce the same output. That's great. That's what yeah. I was looking for because it's so hard to debug. You know, if you're changing your prompt. But it's also randomly changing. You don't know. You, you have too many. Happening too much. You don't know what made a difference in the result. Was it the randomness, or was it the change in the prompt? Yeah, just set a seed. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Just uh, to clear something. Um, is it a question? Uh, I was just going to say about ChatGPT. Um, sorry, I thought you were just saying the aspect about ChatGPT of um, uh, it, uh, like when, when you type in, like, do you want do you have anything more to say about it? <coughs> and the chat GPT will actually come up with more answers to uh, to, to, to what it already already said. So if there's that uh, chat GPT, you actually have uh, um, more to talk about than uh, than what um, you know, what it's actually saying at the moment in, in response to your question. So. Yeah, it does. Um, so basically, the way that it was trained was using like reinforcement learning from human feedback, like where it like took into account human preferences, um, and so like. So basically, like, so what what must have happened like during the training is that like, you know, like like most of the human labor lab, labelers like must have preferred like kind of you know shorter answers. Um, so like in, instead of giving like, I don't know like like eight paragraphs, like most people might have preferred like four and so on. So yeah, that's that's probably why. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean uh, how deep it goes, I'm not sure. So it there's definitely. Basically, with with other uh, tools, but the other idea is just just create a much larger model, and it'll just take care of itself. Like, what is your view? Like, if you had a crystal ball, how do you think? Um, like, what do you think the future is for for ChatGPT or the the large language model sort of ecosystem? And the other thing is, has anyone like tried hooking it up to like executable things? So, you know, when you give it a, a toy programming problem, and it'll do a function, and usually those are right, but larger programs are full of bugs. Like. Has anyone tried sort of hooking it up to see if you could empirically sort of try to execute it and, and figure out, you know, uh, after a few random tries, which one works and then give that back as the answer? So to address the first question, so like, so there are already tools that do this. So like Langchain, for example, is, a, is an open source tool that like can basic, that like can allow you to like, basically like link a large language model with some external source of computation. So like Wolfram as you're talking about. Um, and then I, so I actually think that that is the future rather than creating a larger model. Um, because like when you create a larger model, like you make every single call to it more, more expensive. And so like when you, when you think about a large model, like it can do, it can do a lot more than just like generation, right? Like you can do other tasks like translation, summarization, like, um, classification and so on, and so then, like you know, if you make the when you make the model larger, you'll make a task that's like non-expensive, like classification. You'll make that way more expensive, and so then, like you know, why not like you know instead of like kind of putting like all of that you know reasoning ability into the model itself, like you know why not just like attach other sources of computation as necessary? So I think that that is the future. And then, like, what was your second question again? Uh, has anyone tried to hook it up to? You know, like right now it says, yeah, I can't email, I can't actually run this program to test it. I can't actually, um, you know, create a shell environment where, where I can 
check if my output actually works. But has anyone actually sort of tried hooking it up to actually make it, um, like if you ask it a programming problem, yeah, it'll, it'll probably give you back some bugs, but uh, has anyone actually tried hooking it up so it would try it on its own? See yeah, what the I think were? like, yeah, I think like with, with Langchain, people have tried to do that. Um, and so like, yeah, I, I'd link to it in this presentation and then I'll, I'll send it out. And so like, if you just, if you just look at the like Langchain, like GitHub repo, you'll see a bunch of examples. And I think one of them is like, you know, code related like that. Um, so yeah. Awesome, thank you, that was great. Applause. All right, uh, next up we have S Sacco. Okay. Oh, let's see. Um, no, 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 you're, no, you're getting, you, you go. This is, this is to kill time while you're setting up uh, and while you're figuring out how to get your, uh, your laptop screen on the TV. Yeah, if you guys aren't already on the Hacker Dojo Slack, uh, we can get you on there. Or the Hacker Dojo Discord. All right. Speaking of. Okay. All right. Yeah, you can go ahead and start. Okay. Hey, Sako. I, I'm working as DevOps slash security engineer at a company called Gladly. And GoUp is my side gig where I share experiences. So let's start with a question. Uh, do you like to document? <laughs> you, okay. You're good. Uh, how many of you heard or know what is DevOps? Okay. How about how many of you used or heard about Terraform? What's Terraform? Correct. Infrastructure as a code. Okay. Sounds good. Let's start. Why we need first in first place the DevOps? It's basically bringing development and operation practices together to ship your software <laughs> fast and frequently. That's all thing you, you, you need to know about the DevOps. So you need to a bit understand better your application. You need to understand the requirement coming out of it. And then based on that, go and design scalable, secure, reliable, and cost-effective architecture, which is more and more becoming the key of the success of any early stage, especially startups, because if you screw, screw up your application stack in early stage, it will slow down, doesn't matter how many engineers you hire, the, their productivity will be really depend on that. Uh, because let's say if just the testing or your CI CD taking much time, it means the developers have to wait till it finish up and so forth. So definitely you have to prioritize in early and late stage as well. So now let's see what are the key questions that DevOps, five pillars of DevOps. This is from AWS, uh, well architectured framework. So this is operational excellence, which is what we were talking earlier, how to make uh, to ship your product fast and frequently, security obviously, reliability, performance, and cost. So talking to that, uh, now let's go, if you are starting with DevOps or you just would like to understand what are the skills you need, because let's say in early stage you can afford hiring somebody, but you still need to uh, build your uh, infrastructure in right direction. So for the programming, Python, Shell, Go, a bit of uh, operating system experiences, preferably the server side, the Unix. And cl cloud, you, you have to pick probably one of the cloud providers and uh, AWS, GCP. They also have a nice credit for the startups. If you would like to check out, let's say GCP give you 2,000 and then you have 100,000 if you get into one of the accelerators. So definitely 
and but then you have to spend it within a year. How you can spend in, in a way you can get maximum out of it, at the same time build more cloud agnostic infrastructure that you can move later to another cloud provider, let's say. And here is from the roadmap stage for the DevOps roadmap. I, for the sake of time, I will just leap over it. But again, uh, you, you need a bit of programming language, operating system, and then you come here. Uh, some of the tooling, I will say you don't need that much. For example, uh, configuration management. If you are in Kubernetes world, you don't need Ansible, Chef, Puppet, all this. But definitely you, most of your time as a DevOps engineer will spend using the Terraform. That's what we're gonna touch a bit uh, <laughs> within the time will let us. So basically now we are focusing on this Terraform infrastructure as a pro provisioning. There are Pulumi and other tooling coming around, but still I would say Terraform is a, a leader on that. What's Terraform? It's basically, <laughs> Whatever you are doing manually through the UI, it saves your time to go and codify all this. In a way, it's easier for somebody joining, they can go and understand how your infrastructure is looking like. And it's basically save also you time to scale and so forth. You don't, it saves you from repetitive tasks. There are a few challenges around that, uh, using even Terraform and uh, modules. And I, I, again, for the sake of time, I won't go, but feel free to check out the blog itself and ping me if you need any help. Uh, but basically, you can modularize your old infrastructure in a nice way, and you can have development staging production environment where you can reuse that modular code, so you don't need to do. So for the versioning, Terraform before 1.0, it was breaking a lot, uh, but it's more now stable, but let's say if you need to switch between the version manager because of let's say different modules uh, and so forth, you can use some nice tooling. More and more tooling comes around that uh, on top of Terraform. So that's kind of, I listed a few of them that just as a starting for you, if you don't have much experience. So functional testing, make sure uh, your code works. The security side, negative texting, somebody, Knows what's negative testing? Okay, it, it's written here. <laughs> it's in a way that uh, you, 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 for your, let, let's say in application development, there is, you expect certain inputs and so forth, but what are the edge, ca edge cases if somebody enters and try to? So this kind of testing, you can use tooling like TF security or Terrascan, which is static analyzer. Syntax checking, make sure uh, by the way, you, you can read, all good? Okay. okay, syntax checking you can, uh, for your configuration file, if let's say for naming and so forth, or the formatting, which is linting, uh, you can run with your Terraform. Tagging is especially key uh, to, ta uh, to, <laughs> to not see surprises in your cloud cost if you forget something. So it's definitely tagging per all the resources helps you. Uh, especially if you haven't set limits in your budget and so forth. It, or somebody can go and do some uh, blockchain mining and all this stuff, so you can easily spot these kind of things and setting nice monitoring alerting around that. For logging and debugging, uh, by, by the way, uh, I, I will mention in the end, but this is one of our friends from AMV0, Ohad. It's a nice project, TerraTag. Uh, Documentation, you don't have to really go manual right. This Terraform docs will do it for you. And I will say still, you see some challenges, gotchas while you do Terraform apply, even it doesn't, uh, you don't see these errors do while running Terraform plan. But uh, you can, there are a few debugging steps you can do, which I listed here. But again, they're not perfect. You still need to get some of these errors and try to uh, build your own expertise. Uh, for local development, usually I haven't put here, but there are some best practices around, let's say, development, staging, production to call the module and doing the release for the module itself to make sure that uh, you are not breaking your uh, 
production infrastructure because you change something in staging and so forth. So this is the coding flow and naming conventions. Again, I listed some uh, as some of the best practices where Google came, HashiCorp itself came, and some community maintained. If you haven't heard Anton Bebenko, he's maintaining uh, a lot of the modules for the Terraform. And uh, he's also owning this weekly TF where he's continuously sharing all these news coming with the Terraform. Uh, that being said, uh, that's it. I don't know how I'm doing with timing, but thank you. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Let's see, we've got our first question over here. Uh, <coughs> I wanna know what's the place of Linux in DevOps? Like importance, in, in terms of importance. Yeah, that's a good question. So, so I think in the previously pre-Kubernetes world, you needed to know a bit more deeper, understand the processes, networking, and all this stuff. Things slightly get better with the containers and Kubernetes, but you still need to understand all the uh, how the operating system works because that way you can optimize your containers even and the base image, make sure the dependency management side of it is good. But you don't as frequently as go and do the manual changes. Your infrastructure has to be as much as immutable, meaning the containers, that's, you don't go manual change, but you still need to make sure it's the OS, with the base image and so forth you are using there kind of uh, optimized and configured right away. Anyone else have any other questions? We've got a question over here. Yeah, I'm just curious. Can you sl uh, share your slide deck with us? Uh, it's uh, I already put in the blog, gofast.com. Oh, okay. All right, that's great. And I spent one hour, two hours before, so that's value of lightning talk I like. And feel free also to talk to you. Yeah, me. He's, he's just been sliding through his website. This oh, is his okay. blog yeah. website. I, I can log in. <laughs> Thank so you. you. All right. Um, we'll give you another round of applause then. Yay. Thank you. All right. Next we have Chi, digital clothing. Uh, all right. Hi, my name is Chidin Nakalu, and I'm going to be sharing with you an idea that I've been working on. Uh, Sound good? Can you put the microphone higher? Uh, all right. So um, my idea, I call it Life Fit, Your Life Fit. Um, a platform and virtual for virtual closet for virtual uh, fitting and sustainable brands. I think you probably heard about this a couple of times. Has anybody heard about uh, digital clothing? Okay, yeah, I know. Uh, Ed has also had this idea too. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I've uh, done a lot of things from like modeling to you know being in the arts, study psychology, um, worked at Facebook, um, was a researcher, was a designer, and I just kind of came back full circle to a problem that I wanted to solve um, regarding um, sustainability in fashion. And the goal behind this was just to like help a designer, like a small designer who's struggling to um, take pictures of their clothing, um, struggling with like inventory, and um, also like gaining new clients because everybody seems to want to buy from uh, really cheap uh, uh, retailers 
and the big names like Zara, you know, Amazon and so on, which leaves a lot of people sort of behind. So um, the solution is on a two-sided marketplace that helps the designers connect to the um, users um, in a way that they can talk to each other on the platform and kind of walk through the process of customizing um, their clothing before either purchasing or having it made by a tailor. Um, and the problem that we're gonna solve uh, is uh, regarding sizing, fit, and waste. So um, as you know, um, uh, sizing whenever you go to buy something is never fitted in a way that um, is, uni is um, that is uh, actually is aligned across different brands. Every single brand has a different type of sizing. The sizing in China is a lot smaller than sizing for Americans and so forth for Europe and in, in Africa. So uh, one of the major problems uh, is uh, consistent sizing across brands. And when we have consistent sizing, we can reduce uh, the number of uh, clothing that's made, the number of returns, as well as the number of waste that ends up in landfills. Um, and similarly, the client, so the designer, has a lot of problems. They have time to acquire the customers. They have logistic issues. They have to order like thousands of shirts just to sell only like 100 shirts. Um, there's uh, overproduction, and then there's also the marketing. There's a lot of money spent marketing. So this kind of uh, gives way to talking about the millions of waste that we have. Just at last year, um, it was shown that there was about $400 million worth of waste just from e-commerce alone. Majority from Amazon ended up in the landfills. Um, this shows how big of a problem it is and which every season that comes in with the summer, spring, fall, the new clothes get discarded and new ones come to the front. So how do we try to solve this? So one of the ways that I've looked at this, as, uh, as I said earlier, um, connecting customers with designers. Uh, so Your Life Fit is a platform that connects designers with customers with the ability to find sizing and virtual try-on to improve customer decision making and save about a quarter of the designer's production time, about 10 hours average per customer, and reduce the waste of fabrics um, as well as decision making for the, for the customers and reducing returns hopefully by 30% and even more so reducing landfills that end up in developing countries where they have no control over rejecting um, our used clothing. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo of what I had so far. So this is sort of like my user flow. going to Play it real quick, make sure that you don't hear me speak. So I kind of focused on like the body shape and the size of the customer, um, as well as their inputted measurements, which um, I hope to sub support through um, body scanning. Um, and then you have uh, the clothing there in AR. You've kind of heard of AR filters. So the, the choice of clothing that you've had is now being fitted on a model. And then you can change the color. You can also customize like the size. You can kind of put it in the way that you want. So imagine being able to have this uniquely tied to you for every single uh, design you make, regardless of whether you purchase it or regardless of if you end up making it. It could also help inform you on what to wear on a daily basis because we struggle you know, with our wardrobe and we all want to present ourselves in a way that people will take us seriously. So this is geared to people at different levels from occasion, job interviews, all the way, and so on. So that's one way that uh, we've gone about it. And next, um, why um, the, the opportunity I see uh, is going to other countries where there's not a lot of manufacturing happening. Um, there's a lot of countries outside of India and China that produce clothing but are not really supported or recognized. There's countries uh, in West Africa, there's countries in um, 
other um, Southeast Asia that don't have the opportunity to create clothes. So we can reduce the pressure that we put on manufacturing in China and spread that across different countries and also educate them, help even elevate their economy by teaching them how to um, create clothes in this manner and exposing them to the technology. So that's like a bigger vision. Another vision is also um, being able to recycle plastics and polyester, polyethylene, a lot of the mixed fabric that are used in your clothing, being able to recycle them, uh, break them down and reuse them as fibers. So the way that I plan on doing this is by leveraging you know, molecular recycling, going into um, breaking down, collecting the clothes, breaking them down, and then converting them to either like gas, oil, or reusing them again for a clothes provider that is not being toxic. This is a longer vision, so don't worry. <laughs> don't worry about this part. Um, I'm just sharing with you like, you know, how I'm really tackling this and why I'm different from, say, you know, another company that might have thought about this. Um, and this is a way that I come to think about it for that second level is using um, like machine learning to identify the fabric through a camera and then taking that fabric um, and helping the customer to categorize them. And then when we can kind of track the end of life of each clothing for every clothing that you might have in your, in your wall, in your closet, as well as a clothing you're about to buy and putting that possibly on um, a blockchain so we can go into things like digitals, but again, that's like the next level after we're done with the first uh, step where I'm at right now. So um, the ask is, uh, try to get your ideas and what your thoughts are. Um, would love to find a co-founder who's interested and really passionate um, about sustainability as well as knowledgeable in gaming engines, um, knowledgeable in AI, machine learning, um, and yeah, love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do we have any questions? <laughs> So just to clarify. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So just to so just to clarify. So like, it's um, so you said it's like a marketplace or like is it like is it like an app like yeah? You know, like, uh, it's a as a okay. platform, just like you know, like on your mobile phone as well as your, as an e-commerce like a white paper platform where there's a two-sided marketplace. You have like um, designers on one hand, they have all their items and things they could sell in 3D models. And then you have the customer buying the items and they can kind of choose from whichever one they want. And then that designer provides them sort of the end you know, output of the clothing. Well, for... but I feel like wouldn't, won't, won't this functionality be integrated into like, let's say like, I don't know, like people's like Shopify stores or like, you know, like other like, like, I don't know, like other sorts of e-commerce. I mean, Amazon will probably have this like too, right? Like where like, you know, a designer can wear like a clothing manufacturer can upload clothes and then like, you know, the customer will be able to like, you know, see how like the clothes look on them. And I mean, I think, well, I think Walmart has this functionality already. So like won't, like won't that kind of functionality be just embedded in like every other like e-commerce platform? Like, you know, why are you building a separate platform for it? Oh, so that people who don't have access to Walmart and Amazon can also have that, you know, embedded into their own like application or their own e-commerce website. Okay, I see. Hi, no, can it? Yeah, there we go. Um, not so much a question as a comment. I just want to say that I, this is a really good idea. I know a lot of people who have been looking for literally exactly this. Like I'm pretty sure recently my sister and I were Google searching, trying to find exactly this type of company. Um, so yeah, no, I, j I just think it's a great idea. And I just, yeah, that's all I have to say. Oh, thank you. We chatted earlier, I, I get it. I love the idea. Um, yeah. One thought I, I wanted to just ask you is, so we're in this time of era where uh, a lot of the waste comes from fast fashion, right? 
But now we're moving into this new player in the space who's using machine learning just to find out what trends are, what's the hottest thing that everybody wants and searching for. If you ever heard of Xian, it's a, now they're calling it real-time fashion. So they're doing very small runs in almost a matter of like three to five days, and they're, that, they're breaking the market right now. They're, they're growing faster than Amazon. I just wanted to get, what's your thoughts on this r now real-time fashion and how potentially this could play into that real-time fashion, right? Like yeah. what if your iterations at, you know, at, that, at the level of where it's unique and it's, it, you have these custom designers and let's say it's almost drop shipping my style, right? What, I just want to get your thoughts on that and do you have aspirations of going in challenging this real-time thing? Yeah, like the whole point of creating a way for designers and customers to connect to each other, especially designers that you normally not hear about, is to combat real-time fashion. Uh, I, I hear a lot of designers who have complained about Sheen stealing their designs. Um, I've seen also small uh, fashion uh, designers who have had been able to partner with Sheen um, for example, Chantelle in like uh, LA, she's doing uh, LA Fashion Week right now. Um, I, w I was just like blown away, like, you know, how there's no like IP to like design anymore. So I'm hoping that something like this could help give like the designers a little bit more agency on their designs, especially if your virtual design could be sort of coded to you and identified like, okay, this is your, your style, you know, you could, Possibly blockchain. Not that I'm super, you know, going that way, but that's a, that's one way that you could do that. Um, yeah, because because I mean, with I, I thought about this like this could have totally gone in a fast fashion way, like you know, design it and then drop ship it. But that's not what I want. I want to kind of encourage people to think about things a little bit more deliberately. Cool. Uh, does anyone else have any questions? I love it because I love fashion and looking good and feeling good. And uh, it's hard to find clothes that fit. Yeah. So. Do you have any technical questions? Like I have like another slide for like <laughs> the, the back I end. I think we've like... got time for it. Do we've got time for it? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Go for it. I have to like find it. I, I guess I could just like uh, explain how this was. So it's funny, I and my partner uh, partnered together um, so first of all, I started out with just like sketching um, a while ago, like finding out people want. So I went through like research. Um, I interviewed like three sets of like 15 people, surveyed people, talked about their shopping habits and their styles. So I went the whole gong ho user research, like self-funded alone. I partnered with like a designer to try to understand how they would bring like modular fashion, how they would try to create that process to cater it to like one person. And then um, after that, I kind of iterated and um, decided to add on the AR aspect. Um, so basically taking that body shape, so you can see everybody has a, a body shape. We have like rectangle shapes, we have circular shapes, we have you know apple, apple shapes, and everybody has something that fits them well. What works for one person doesn't always work for the other person. So the whole goal is to be able to find what works for you and basically cater that to you. And this could be what you already have or what you would like to have in the future. So that process will take like machine learning, which I'm not proficient in at this time, but I manually like sort of designed it to show what that system design would look like. And then after that, um, I would say at the time, the AR foundation bot detection had just come out. So I was really excited because I couldn't find anything. There was no stack showing how to do proper detection outside of Snapchat. So this was created in Unity um, uh, using that uh, bug detection. And then we layered on like the clothing, clothing simulation to kind of mimic the movement. And then we have to kind of play around with the fabric to make sure that it's fit on the body. So showing that we need to um, come up with a model that resizes the dummy and the vertices of, of the, of each, uh, for each body type, so we have to resize them. Um, there's also like the um, challenge of like, how do you see yourself? So I had to use a big monitor to kind of visualize myself from my phone. So I kind of get my phone to the monitor and had to like, you know, pose myself in a way to make sure that I was getting fitted within the, um, 
the augmented uh, images. So there's a lot of uh, technical challenges with like making sure that the you know the body detection knows where I am, that the lighting is not too bad, so that it doesn't like uh, get uh, secluded, that the shaders are you know working. Um, there's also issues about like gathering the 3D object so that when you send it to somebody else, it doesn't disintegrate. Like how do you securely transfer that? How do you create a database and assign that to every single person? So there's a lot of like challenges that I, I need help just like constructing and figuring out. Awesome, thanks. Um, oh, yeah. oh, we've got a question. Um, so, um, so there are many uh, 3D games out there, and uh, they have very uh, interesting costumes or uh, costume designs, using, for example, marvelous designer, uh, and it looks very, very realistic. For example, uh, in PUBG, there are hundreds of costume sets, and uh, um, and I feel like there's a market for uh, people to maybe buy those sets in real life um, if there's a way to. Uh, have, um, for example, those indie, um, indie clothing, the clothing, uh, uh, the, 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 or uh, clothing makers, um, to uh, make the clothing for the people who want to buy costumes they see in in computer games. Yeah, yeah, totally. That's definitely like a, a great target market. Uh, I should put my email so that we, um, if you wanted to contact me, you could also. Um, I, I don't know what the best way to do this without yeah, typing we'll, it out. We'll, okay, we'll figure it out okay. afterwards. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Round of applause. Um, so. so I signed up. I'll give a quick talk. Um, I was... I brought two books with me today, and I recommend both of these books because um, I love to buy books off of Amazon. So the first one is called Deep Learning for Coders with Fast AI and PyTorch, and this is by Jeremy Howard and Sylvain Gugger. And uh, what I like about this book is it's uh, good at explaining difficult things because I've bought a few different artificial intelligence books and this was my favorite in terms of explaining stuff in ways that even I can understand. So my background is I'm a full stack web engineer but I know that uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning and and stuff like that is really trendy and cool and hip so I wanted to learn more about it and I bought a, a few different books and some of them were easier to understand than others. So this is a really good one. Um, Fast AI and PyTorch are Python libraries for machine learning, and they're kind of like uh, TensorFlow and Keras, but they're designed to be uh, easier to learn and get started with. And then the second book I want to share with you today is called Staff Engineer, Leadership Beyond the Management Track by Will Larson. And this is just a book all about engineering. And uh, each chapter is a different interview with a real engineer. And I, um, yeah, it's just a bunch of different people talking about what they do as a staff level engineer, which is kind of like the highest level engineer. And um, some people in the book are from like really big companies and they talk about what they did to get to that position in the company um, and you know some of the challenges they faced and stuff like that. So I just wanted to recommend those two books since uh, they were two of the best engineering related books that I read last year. So with that, uh, unless anybody else has any last minute surprise lightning talks that they wanna give, uh, we're gonna wrap it up. Um, yeah, uh, be sure to uh, check out the Hacker Dojo calendar for all of our events. And we encourage you to host your own Hacker Dojo events. So w we, we need more people planning and hosting events. Uh, so please do that. And uh, yeah, we'll just hang out here 
afterwards. And uh, that's all for me. Bye, everyone. <laughs>